Hi. So yes, I'm going to be talking about Discovery, which is funded by the ARC. It's part of the ARC Starting Well theme, which focuses on youth mental health. And this is led by Professor David Fowler. So as you can see, here is the research team and the research team spans across Sussex, Surrey and Norwich. So what is Discovery? So in Discovery, we looked at the mental health and social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, young people. And we wanted to collect data on young people's their lived experiences of the pandemic to look at and explore factors related to uh, risk and resilience with regards to the impact of the pandemic on their mental health. So this was so that we could understand how to support recovery, recovery, both individual recovery and also community recovery with regards to the social and economic consequences of the pandemic. And in particular, we were interested in vulnerable communities and vulnerable young people because Evidence suggests that the mental health impact of the pandemic is likely to be greater for young people and especially vulnerable young people, such as those with pre-existing mental health difficulties, those who are not in education, employment or training, so termed as NEAT. Um, young people are so more socially isolated and also coastal communities and more deprived areas. So thinking about the impact of the enforced social restrictions, research has indicated that the mental health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, these are mainly due to the direct loss of social interaction, obviously due to lockdowns and the social restrictions. Um, now, this is in line with previous research, which has found that enforced social distancing, as in other pandemics, this has been associated with long term negative mental health in young people. And if we're if we're thinking about the pandemic and all the COVID-19 restrictions, this severely changed young people's um, social and economic activities. And obviously there's disruption. There's a lot of disruption which resulted in disruption in uh, support and services available to young people. If we consider the context of all this, the consequences of the enforced social restrictions and the significant and long lasting mental health impacts on young people, there's a need to understand the mental health and the so psychosocial consequences of the pandemic, especially uh, with young people who are vulnerable and more likely to be adversely affected. And when we're thinking about supporting recovery planning on both the individual and also the community level, we need to identify and test the risk and protective factors and also be able to work with young people in local communities to understand uh, their needs and the needs of more vulnerable groups. So Discovery, uh, Discovery is a mixed methods longitudinal study. It was online survey and semi-structured interviews which were conducted by phone or video. And there's two time points, January to July 2021. And we also collected data from the July 2021 to January 2022. Now, recruitment was across Sussex, Kent, Surrey and Norfolk. And from, we collected data from educational settings, community and social groups, mental health, well-being, social care, or voluntary um, sector services. And what we wanted to understand is firstly, the relationship between uh, the social factors and young people's mental health during the pandemic, and also recovery for young people and communities. What support, what support um, is needed for this? What we found so far, so from our baseline data, we had uh, 105 participants. Average age of participants was 24, majority were female and white British. Approximately 35% came under the term of NEAT and 93% um, had pre-existing mental health difficulties. On measures of anxiety and depression, 40% of participants' scores suggested severe anxiety, and roughly about 38% of participants' scores suggested severe depression. So to investigate the social and mental health impacts of the pandemic on vulnerable young people, we first took a social cure perspective. 
Now, this suggests that groups we identify with can impact how we feel, behave and interact with others. And this can uh, provide resources such as hints of connection, which can support our health and well-being. Claire Vella, who is a PhD student for Starting Well, found that during COVID-19, similar to past research, being a member of multiple groups before the pandemic was significantly associated with maintaining these group memberships during the pandemic. And that maintaining group memberships was also significantly associated with reduced symptoms of self-rated depression, anxiety and psychotic-like symptoms. Claire uh, went on then and explored whether social connection, uh, both online and in person, or hope mediated the relationship between group membership, continuity and self-rated mental health problems. And when looking at self-rated depression, in-person social connection, online social connection and hope were all significant mediators. Uh, she found that when looking at self-rated anxiety, in-person social connection was a significant mediator, but that online social connection and home weren't found to be. And also when looking at self-rated psychosis-like experiences, only hope was a significant mediator. But just to note, while these are interesting uh, findings, the data is cross-sectional, so we can't make causal inferences about the associations. And it is possible uh, that the associations are bidirectional. So I've been looking at NEAT and non-NEAT groups. As we know, being neat, now this is linked with increased risk of mental health problems and negative life outcomes. In 2019, neat rates amongst young people, 16 to 24 in the UK, were approximately about 10.5%. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, young people became, they became even more vulnerable as they experienced social exclusion and mental health problems. So I was interested in help-seeking um, intention. Uh, now, help-seeking uh, behaviour, this is a protective factor in young people and is key for mental health, well-being and development. However, um, some adolescents do not, don't seek professional help when they need to. So I compared NEAT and non-NEAT groups uh, for depression, anxiety and psychotic-like symptoms and findings suggested significantly greater depression symptoms amongst NEAT participants than non-NEAT participants, which um, this is in line with previous research. But uh, both anxiety and psychotic-like symptoms were found to be non-significant. So with regards to help seeking intention, I looked to see whether self-rated social connection in person or hope mediated the relationship between neat status and help seeking intention during COVID-19. Now, when we refer to the likelihood of seeking help, when we um, help seeking intention, participants were asked to rate themselves on seeking help from a range of people. So professional people such as teachers or GPs, non-professionals such as members of the family or um, a friend, and also, in fact, no one. Who would they or wouldn't they seek help from on a personal or emotional for a personal or emotional problem? So with social connection in person, I found that uh, it mediated the relationship between neat status and help seeking intention. And similarly, also hope was found to mediate the relationship between neat and, and people help seeking people's help seeking intention. So the interviews, obviously, we wanted to gain an in-depth understanding of young people's lived experiences of the pandemic. So we conducted interviews with 25 young people. Interviews focused on areas such as mental health and relationships, service, uh, support, community and the indirect and also the direct effect of the pandemic on these different areas. Um, we also asked young people about what help and support uh, they wanted. So we started looking at the interview data for NEAT participants and finding from this subgroup implied like that they considered lockdown as a continuation of their normal life experiences. Life hadn't changed much. This was the life that they'd been living for some time. 
Also, lockdown removed the pressure of life. What society demanded of them, all of a sudden, there wasn't these demands to go out, look for employment, go out and interact socially. All these pressures weren't, were no longer present. What they actually wanted was someone that they could speak to on a regular basis and help with problems, somebody, a trusted person that they built up a that they could build a relationship up with. We are still analysing the data as well. Jen Keane, who is a clinical doctoral student from Norfolk, um, she explored the young people uh, with pre-existing mental health issues, their experiences of living through the pandemic. Jen looked at 13 participants who had previously been part of the Prodigy study. Now, as you'll see, Jen found two main themes. First, impact of mental health on experiences of the pandemic. Now, this theme looked at how participants' experiences and lives before the pandemic, how it impacted the nature of the challenges encountered and their responses. And as you can see, uh, this uh, theme comprised of three sub-themes, looking at ways of coping, how some participants were so impacted by the pandemic, their previous experiences um, acted as a protective factor and participant stress response, how previous experiences of mental health intensified challenges. Now, the second theme, impact of the pandemic on mental health, this also made up three sub-themes focused on, focused on ways the experiences of the pandemic affected mental health, it explored meaningful changes, pandemic supported by positive changes and how it affected mental health, impact recovery from mental health difficulties, how the pandemic impacted the gains that had previously been made to participants improving their lives, and previous beliefs, beliefs this focus about beliefs about the world. Jen also found there was a cross-cutting theme, avoiding versus approaching. This captured how participants responded to the challenges and, and the opportunities that they experienced. So what now? Uh, well, we've got the Together study, which focuses on young people struggling with mental health. And uh, Claire Vella is shortly going to tell you a bit more about this study. And we've also got Catalyst. Catalyst is looking at improving the quality and coverage of youth services regionally in deprived community. It's going to be running for three years and it's working across areas of high social and economic deprivation in Kent, Surrey and Sussex. And we'll be inviting young people with lived experiences, family members, local community members and staff from existing services to work with us to develop, um, to implement and evaluate an asset based and task sharing youth model, one that is sustainable. So uh, that is the discovery study and what we've been doing. Thank you for listening. And if you want to find out anything further, please email, email myself or Claire. Thank you. I'm Claire Vella. I'm an ARC PhD student at the University of Sussex. And I'm really pleased to share with you today some details about the Together study, which is trialing an optimised social groups intervention in services to enhance social connection and mental health for vulnerable young people. Um, and this is just a quick slide really to show that multiple components have sort of gone into creating the Together study. And I'm going to talk through some of these now. So first of all, just to mention that behind Together is a whole research team. Um, so obviously a very big thank you to everyone who's helped to kind of contribute so far. And like with any study, really, uh, the first thing we did was we thought about, well, what do we know so far? And when we think about um, sort of social factors in relation to mental health, a real key theory is the social cure theory, which Leanne mentioned in her talk as well, which is about when you feel connected or you identify with multiple social groups, this can have really profound benefits for your physical health, mental health and well-being. Um, and when we think about social groups, it's not just the typical friendship groups. It, it's, it's way more than that. And it can be things like if you feel connected with your partner and you have this sense of your team, that can be one of your social groups. Or equally, if you feel like you identify with a wider community group or culture, that can also be one of your social groups. 
And there's a growing body of evidence that shows that social factors, um, well, I suppose social connection can really benefit health, but equally social isolation can have a detrimental impact. And so recommendations have started to be made for services to look to address social isolation. And a part of this is to do with the typically services focus on areas that while are really important, don't always match how young people might present or what is most meaningful to them. I suppose on from this slide, we can see that the, there's evidence growing that maybe focusing on an intervention that uh, focuses on social connection could be really important, but what do young people think about this as an idea? So we presented the idea of an intervention that focuses on social connection to a panel of young people with lived experience who uh, were part of a research event that was organised by the University of Nottingham and Emerging Minds Research Network. And this was like a Dragon's Den style event. So they e were each given like a pretend pot of money, which was their investment fund that they could give to people that they liked their proposals. Um, and really promisingly, our proposal for this intervention was the most supported um, and they gave us some really useful feedback that even though young people are very digitally involved actually they felt that an intervention like this would be best face to face but equally we should always think about the individual's preference on how they would like to access it. Another thing that helped to contribute to the Together study was our findings from Discovery. So obviously Leanne has gone into this in a much more detail in her talk, but as a really quick overview again, um, you know, when we were investigating the social and mental health impacts of the pandemic for vulnerable young people, we found that maintaining multiple group memberships, maintaining a sense of social connection and hope were significant factors in one way or another with their self-rated scores of depression, anxiety and psychotic-like experiences. From this point, again, you know, we're building this evidence around this thought that, OK, maybe focusing on social connection for young people's mental health could be really important. Um, and when I started my PhD, one of the things that I thought about doing was working with young people to develop an intervention from scratch. But then when we reflected, we thought, well, there's potentially no need to sort of reinvent the wheel if something has already been created. And this slide is showing that, you know, there is something. It, it's called Groups for Health. Um, and it was developed by a team from the University of Queensland in Australia. It's based on uh, lots of theory that's already out there. Um, as an intervention, it's very short. It's only got five sessions. And it's fully manualised, comes with a workbook, and it focuses on the importance of social connection and identifying with groups for our health and well-being. And the evidence so far shows that Groups for Health has reduced loneliness, stress and depression compared to a range of control groups, including um, a control group where it was young people who were undergoing group CBT. So this is all really, really promising stuff, but a lot of this research has all been based in the context of Australia um, and predominantly also with adults. So there leaves a question there around, OK, well, how about in the UK? Would we find similar things? So this leads me on to the Together study, um, and we have two main components to the Together study. So one part is a feasibility randomised control trial, and then there's also a practitioner survey. And our key questions for, from this study is that, is it feasible for us to conduct a randomised control trial when delivering the Groups for Health intervention for young service users with mental health difficulties who are accessing services in the UK? Do they find it acceptable, accessible? Is it safe? And do they indicate any changes are needed in order to improve it? Um, and also thinking about, well, what do practitioners think about it? What are their experiences? Um, or attitudes towards an intervention that focuses on social connection? Is that something they want to work with their young people on? Um, and are there any contextual factors that might make it harder or, or easier to implement this type of intervention? Um, as you can see, we are a registered trial and we've started recruiting and we plan to finish by end of May next year.
And one of the things we wanted to do uh, before we started trialing the intervention was we wanted to speak to uh, practitioners and young people just to get their feedback about what they think about this before we start trialing it. And also wanted to check if there were any sort of immediate changes that we might need to make just to make it that little bit more accessible, particularly for the more vulnerable young people. So I conducted a focus group with four practitioners from an NHS team. I also did some one-to-one -one interviews with four young people who had lived experiences of mental health difficulties or social isolation. And I sent them all information about the groups for health intervention in advance. And essentially, whether it was the focus group or the interview, these were largely unstructured sessions. So I allowed people just to share their feedback really freely with me. Uh, what I did do, though, was as I was collecting some really useful uh, feedback, this then helped me to have some um, useful follow up and prompt questions that I would ask people once they had finished sharing their feedback with me. So this is an example of, of some of the really key feedback that we received. And what we'll do is we'll use this to optimise the intervention uh, when we start to trial it. And one of the, the main things was that particularly for um, young people who have quite severe social anxiety, um, it was felt that the intervention would, would be better if it was delivered on a one to one basis, at least at first, with the potential to introduce some group sessions towards the end to see if they would be able to join a group session for the very first time. Um, there were also things like there might be a need to adapt some of the language. So for some young people, the word groups might not be that accessible. Um, and so working with them to think about which language would be best for them. And even things like um, for perhaps more neurodiverse young people, if there was any activities that required them to rate something from on like a numbered scale, making sure that each of those numbers also had a word response or using pictures instead. So we're definitely going to use these to optimise the intervention. My next slide is well, what does our feasibility randomised control trial look like? So uh, we are focusing on Sussex based. Um, services. We have a couple at the moment. And on the right hand side, you can see that we're recruiting intervention providers. So these are typically practitioners from within those services. They're then required to have training to deliver the groups for health intervention. And we actually had our training session yesterday, which went really, really well. Um, they will then be asked to deliver the intervention to eligible young people. And then on the left, you can see that we're also looking to recruit about 30 service users aged 16 to 25 who are experiencing mental health difficulties. And this will be referrals from those services. And a key part of their journey in the trial is that they will be randomly allocated to either receive the groups for health intervention alongside their usual care or continue to receive their usual care only, at least within the context of the study. And then a key component for both um, sort of participants is that they will be asked to um, complete an interview with us where they can share really, really important information about what the experience was like, either to deliver it or to receive it. You know, what was helpful? What did they like about it? What were things that they just couldn't engage in or, or you know, needed to change? Things like that. So that's going to, we hope, provide some really, really useful information. And because it's a feasibility trial, at the moment, we're more interested in these kind of feasibility parameters to tell us whether we think this is going to work in the UK and whether we can then look to kind of get funding to run it on a much larger scale. So we're looking for that 50% or more of the referred young people will be eligible, that 80% or more of the eligible young people who consent to take part will then stay in the trial until the very end that when we start collecting data from young people, so we have these sort of assessment packs, that 80% or more of the assessment packs will be completed. That 80% or more of the young people who are allocated to receive the intervention will go on to complete at least four out of the five sessions. And that 80% or more of the core components of Groups for Health will be delivered to them. And so now really quickly, just about our practitioner survey. So we are accessing or going to NHS and non-NHS services, and we're inviting practitioners who work with young people. And this could be anywhere within the range of 16 to 25 years old. We're asking them to consent to take part in a 15 minute online survey. Uh, we're hoping for a minimum sample size of about 100. Hopefully we can go beyond that. 
And the survey looks to cover, importantly, this kind of section in green, which is um, what do practitioners think about supporting social connection in their routine practice? Is that something that they want to do, that they find important? Uh, what do they think about a social based intervention for young people with mental health difficulties? Do they think that that would be an important focus for young people or not? And what do they think about testing a social based intervention in the context of a research trial? Do they think that's a good idea or not? So at the moment, we're currently recruiting from both NHS and non-NHS services um, in the Sussex and Norfolk and Suffolk areas. Um, so if you are a practitioner <laughs> and you would like to participate, you can use the QR code that's on the screen there or the link when the um, slides are kind of sent round. Um, equally, we are very much open to new sites and services all across the UK. So if you are from an NHS service that's beyond those areas, get in touch and we can get you set up to be able to take part. And then lastly, I suppose, I mean, this is a very brief summary, but what do we hope to learn from the TOGETHER study? And essentially we're looking for, because it's a feasibility study, we're looking at, we'll do our plans for this research study work. And really importantly, what is the groups for health intervention experience like for young people with mental health difficulties and intervention providers in the UK? And also what do practitioners think about a social based intervention for young people experiencing mental health difficulties? So thank you so much for listening. Um, as before with Leanne's talk, if you'd like more information, then please do get in touch and you can contact me on that email address there. So thank you very much.